Well, good morning, everyone. It is cold in Florida. Woke up to 35 degrees. 30. Could you stretch your hands to this guy right here? This is Devin. Don't worry, it's going to be 80 degrees by Thursday. That's how Florida does it. But we're so glad that you're here today. I want to welcome all those that are watching online around the world. There are people that have joined us. I know there are a lot of first time guests that are here. We want you to know that you're important, that you belong, you matter. There's a place for you at Countryside. Let's welcome all of our guests and those that are watching online right now. Well, we're in a series called The Best Way, which we're going to get to in just a moment. But I want to let you know that we are doing concerts again at Countryside. So coming up April 1st is Jeremy Camp is going to be here at Countryside. Um, we want you to know, you know, if you buy them online, they charge you like $15 for a fee. I don't know what that fee is. I don't like that fee. When I go to buy concert tickets and they, they throw in this fee at the end, I usually click off. But at Countryside, if you buy it here, there is no fee. Only for Countryside people. We have a limited number of tickets that are available. You can buy those tickets in our apparel area in the North Lobby. But that's going to be great coming up at the end of the year. Just got noticed that We the Kingdom is going to be back here at Countryside. They are really one of the top groups that are out there right now. But it's exciting to be a church that can open our doors to the community. The community could come in and it makes them just see what's going on, but it's a service that we do. I think it's important that as a church that we are reaching our community in different ways. Concerts are just one of those ways. Helping Hands is another one of those ways. To see three days a week, there are people, over 150 cars going through our line, getting food during this time, which is so important, in the middle of this pandemic, that we stand up and we are the church to this community. You need help? We're here to be a helping hand to those that are in need. Aren't you glad that you're part of a church that reaches the community in that way? So we're finishing up our 21 days of prayer and fasting this Wednesday night. So I want to personally invite everyone to come out this Wednesday night. The, the cafe opens at 5 o'clock. This week in the cafe, the special is Chick-fil-A. All the Christians said... Christians love their Chick-fil-A, don't they? But at our Chick-fil-A, so you get a sandwich, you get chips, you get cookies, you get lemonade, all for $6. You're not getting that at Chick-fil-A. You're getting that at Countryside. So you come, it's 6 o'clock is our Ephesians class. So we've had over 400 people attending each week in our Ephesians class. And then we are gearing up for a powerful night of closing out these 21 days of prayer and fasting. How many have never been to a worship Wednesday? Well, we invite you this week, brother to come to a worship Wednesday. Come and let's just see the power of God move in this place. Can you say amen to that? So the best way, that's our series. The best way is God's way. We're looking at living our lives the way that Jesus lived his life. Loving people the way that Jesus loved people. Living in the moment like Jesus lived in the moment. I loved last week with Pastor Andrew. Didn't he do a great job last week as he talked about the importance of being in the moment instead of letting our minds go everywhere to be engaged and living? Are you, are you still here? Are you still here? All right, I loved that last week. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm here. But it takes a discipline to really live in the moment. Because each day that passes, we don't get back. We live our day, and if we live it in the moment, how much greater can God use us as a vessel in every moment of every day? So this week, we're going to be talking, as we continue in the way of Jesus, we're going to be talking about our prayer life. So let me ask you, how many believe in the power of prayer? Raise your hand. How many believe in the power of prayer, but you know in your heart you don't pray as often as you should? I'm transparent. 
You know, a lot of people, they believe in the power of prayer, but they oftentimes get disappointed because sometimes they feel like God's not answering your prayers or God's not answering your prayers the way that you want God to answer your prayers or he's not answering your prayers in the timing that you want your timing of your prayers to be answered. I want you to know it's so important that we know that God's ways are not our ways. I look back at my life and there were things that I was praying for. I look back now 30 years later and I'm like, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't marry that girl. How many can say amen to that? Look at your wives and say, amen, I'm glad. Hey, Elaine, I'm, I'm glad. All right. But you see, in Jesus' life, there was a constant communication between Jesus and the Father. No matter what was happening around him, no matter what the disciples were going through, no matter what trouble or when he was being beaten, no matter what was going on around him, he always stayed in the moment in prayer with the Father. He prioritized God's presence in every area of his life. You see, how did he do it? He overcame temptations. He, he healed people. He loved so deeply beyond our wildest imagination, Jesus loved. He loved people that seemed unlovable, that no one else would love. Jesus did that. And how he was able to do that? Because he was in constant communication with the Father. So I want you to know, if you want what Jesus had, we need to pray like Jesus prayed. But for so, mon so many of us, we don't do that. So often we struggle with consistency in our prayer life. We, we struggle with how we pray, when we pray, staying consistent, and we wonder why our prayers aren't effective. I want to give you quickly three reasons that so many people have a hard time being consistent in their prayer life. It's in your notes. Number one, some of us lack focus when we pray. You see, we, we start off the year, it's January. This year is going to be different. God, this is the year I am zeroing in. I am focusing up. But I want you to know, I, I look at what's happening in the world. The gyms were packed the first week of January. But it, it's strange. I'm going by the gyms, and they're, they're slowly emptying, just like every year. The fast food places are starting to have long lines again except for Chick-fil-A because they have long lines all the time. But I'm seeing long lines. Why? Because people are unable to stay focused on their goals and staying focused on what they really want to see. If we want this year to be different with our spiritual life, we have to be very consistently, intentionally changing our priorities and changing the way that we live and the way that we pray. See, so many people, they start praying and immediately their mind starts thinking of other things. You can blame it on ADD. You can blame it on being a problem solver. You can blame it on all these things. But really what's happening is you start praying and then you lose focus and you're not even praying anymore. Or maybe you find yourself getting bored. Or maybe you're doing it at night and you fall, fall asleep. But it's important. You want to have effective prayers. Separate yourself and have a focused time with Jesus. Number two, some of us lack confidence. Some of us are like, well, Jesus doesn't hear my prayers. I don't pray as good as everybody else prays. Maybe somebody in your small group, there are such powerful prayers. Maybe you hold hands in a prayer circle and the person next to you is praying the names of God, which is so powerful. And they're praying, Jehovah Jireh, you are our provider. Jehovah Shama, you are here, God. God, you are our peace. You are Jehovah Shalom. God, you are Jehovah Nisi. You are our banner. You are our victory. And you're intimidated. And you find yourself like, Jehovah Toyota, <laughs> Jehovah Kawasaki. And you wonder, and you lose confidence and you feel like maybe you're a prayer failure. Listen to me. God sees our hearts. And we're not going to convince God to answer our prayers because we say it louder or because we say it eloquently. God wants to hear your heart and he wants to hear 
your prayers. So some of us lack focus, some confidence. Some of us lack faith. We're not sure that God will do it. Or if he'll do it, he won't do it for me. Or some of us believe that maybe if we tried harder, if we prayed harder, then God would do it. Or some of us look at our lives and we say, well, when I was a kid, I prayed for my grandparent to get healed and they weren't healed. Some people prayed for their parents' marriage to be healed and they're divorced. And it causes our faith to be rattled. Or maybe you've gone through difficult times and you find yourself where you're at a place of brokenness and hurt and disappointment. I want you to know that God never leaves us and he never forsakes us. So when you're going through the most hard times in your life, the most times where you're most broken, that is not the time to walk with a lack of faith in your heart. That's the time to run to God with everything in you, to believe God's word, which is absolute truth. What God says is yes and amen. His promises don't alter with our culture. His promises don't alter with our situations. His promises and his word are yes and amen. And there's times when you go through those times, you say, God, no matter what things are happening around me, I am standing in faith, trusting you for who you are, and I am going to be faithful to you because, God, I know in your timing, you will always be faithful to to me. Today, the title of the message is, When You've Given Up Prayer. Today, I believe that God wants to stir your faith, stir your hearts, and draw closer to him than you've ever been. How many of you brought your Bibles today? Maybe your phone, whatever you've got. Lord, anoint your word. Open our hearts. Draw us closer to you, I pray. We want more of you, O oh God. We want 2022 to be the best year ever as we lean in to you and your spirit in Jesus' name, amen. So to understand what prayer is, I wanna start by telling you what prayer is not. Prayer is not a formal presentation. Some people, they think if I can pray in the King James language, then God's going to hear my prayer. He's going to understand it because that's the way he taught. And we think if we, thou, thus, yea, that doesn't make a difference. Now, it can. If you pray that way, come pray with me. I love that. I love to hear it. But I want you to know that's not going to make a difference in your prayers of whether you pray in a formal way or not. Prayer is not giving God your daily wish list. Jesus is not Santa Claus. Jesus isn't a genie that you find a magic lamp and you get three wishes. So many people, they think, I'm just going to line up. Here's my daily wish list to God, and God's going to answer my prayer. God's not Santa Claus. He's not a vending machine. Prayer is not a spiritual negotiation. You're not going to say, okay, God, I'll stop cussing if you answer this, this, and this. God, I'll live right, but you've got to answer this. That's not what prayer is. Some people, they think if I negotiate with God, then I'll get the answer to my prayers. God doesn't roll that way. It's not a spiritual negotiation. It's not a performance to try to impress God with how loud or how passionate. Volume's great. There's times you'll see me because of the passion in me. There's times I get loud because I'm passionate. But prayer doesn't impress God or impress others. That's not what prayer really is. You see, in your notes, Jesus teaches us this. Prayer isn't just an action that you do. Prayer is a way that you live. Prayer is a way that we live every single moment of every single day. The way that Jesus lived Jesus prioritized the presence of God and the presence of prayer in his daily life. We see it over and over. He left the crowd to get with the Father and pray. He woke up early in the morning to get away from the disciples to spend time with God to pray. He would go up the mountains to pray. He would go alone by a lake to pray. Jesus prioritized those moments with God, just as we need to prioritize what's important to us 
It's the way that we live every single day. We see in the Gospels, I want to bring up this slide, just different times and just the Gospels that Jesus prayed. He prayed at his baptism. He prayed in the morning, heading to Galilee, going on down the list. He, before Peter called Jesus the Christ, he prayed. At the transfiguration, he prayed. He, the return of the 70, he prayed. I'm not going to go through all of those, but you can see over and over and over and over, those are the priorities of Jesus and if we want to live the way of Jesus, we need to pray. And we need to pray more. You see, prayer wasn't just something that he did. Prayer was the way that Jesus lived. I hear it so often, people say, I just don't have time. You talk about this quiet time. You talk about praying. I just don't have time. I got family. I've got two jobs. I got bills to pay. I've got all this going on. I'm, I got to take my kids to baseball. I got to listen. Never feel that you're too busy to pray because I want to be the first one to tell you. I'm too busy not to pray. I need Jesus in every area of my life and I can't do it without Jesus. I heard someone say that Jesus was my crutch. Jesus is my wheelchair. Jesus is my hospital bed. I don't know what I would do in anything in my life or any area of my life without Jesus being in the forefront and bathing it in prayer. You see, it's almost impossible to be effective in this world without prayer. You see, how are we going to have real joy, peace? How are we going to be an effective witness if we're not filled with the Spirit and have the intimacy with the Father? We live in a world where there's division everywhere. Daily, we walk through relational stress financial pressures, temptations coming from every direction. We have complicated decisions that are in front of us every single day. I need God's presence in all of that stuff and more. I need it all day, not just a few minutes of the day. As a disciple of Jesus Christ, we're in this world but we're not of this world. And we need to, in moment after moment, recognize, God, I can't do this, but through you, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. To be effective in this world, we have to disconnect from the busyness of this world. To disconnect from what is temporal and to connect to who is eternal. Prayer isn't just a momentary action, but prayer is a way of living every moment of every day. In your notes, I want to read to you out of Matthew. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, and this is from the message translation, which is more of a devotional style of translating to encourage you in your daily walk with Christ. And this is what it says from the message. This is Jesus speaking here. And he says, here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play with God. Let me ask you, let me just stop there. Do you have a, a place that you spend time with God? You know, in our houses, we always had a separate room that Elaine would call her prayer room. Don't mess with my wife when she goes to the prayer room. Early on, I didn't know exactly what she did in there. One day I walked in, I got up a little bit earlier than normal, walked in and she was laying face first on the floor. And I thought she was dead. And I said, Elaine, are you okay? She goes, get out of here, I'm praying. And I never went in there again when she was praying. Because let me tell you, that was her time in that place to seek the face of God, face to face, every day. So find a secluded place where you won't be tempted to role play before God, just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. Get alone, block out the noise of this world, eliminate distractions, leave your phone in the other room, get your 5,000 touches after you leave that secluded place with your phone. But the Bible says to be still and know that he's God. You're going through stress. 
You're going through anxiety. You're going through depression and fear. Be still. That's not the time to be more busy. That's the time to be still and know that he is God. You see, intimacy is never accidental. You're never going to have a close, intimate relationship with a friend that you never talk to or you never spend time with. You're never going to have an intimate relationship with your spouse if you never have time to just be still and to be quiet and to talk to each other. Elaine and I, we make a priority of this. This past week, on Friday night, our date night started at 3 o'clock and it went till 10 o'clock. It was seven hours. And let me tell you, we had a great time. We had times where we were laughing. We had times where we were singing music. We had times where we were talking about the details that were happening, things that were upcoming. But let me tell you, at the end of the night, I felt really close to my wife. Really close. Because we spent that alone time with each other. You want that with God? It's not going to happen when you're in the middle of the noise. It's not going to happen when you're constantly in a hurry. You want that intimacy with God is when you separate yourself from all of those things and you get still and you listen and you pray. Well, some of you say, well, what do I pray about? What you pray about is whatever you care about. Whatever you care about, God wants to hear. Because if it's important for you to care about it, your father wants to know and he wants to be a part of that moment and those issues that you may be going through. Paul wrote this from a prison cell in Philippians. In Philippians chapter four, verse six, it says, don't worry about anything. Let's say those few words together. Let's say, it. don't worry about anything. I encourage you to say that every day this week in your prayer time. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. If it's on your mind, it's on God's heart. Talk to God like he is a close, intimate friend. Because he is. He is that friend that sticks closer than a brother. You have questions? Ask God. You need answers? Put those questions before the Lord. You have problems? Let him know what you're feeling. If you're hurting and you're mad, I want you to know God can take it. You can raise your voice and get mad. God is right there. He can take it, and he's always going to surround you with loving arms and with loving care because that's who God is. So, so many people struggle to pray. Why is that? Why is it that so many people struggle to pray even throughout the day? I want to bring this up. How many of you remember the old TV dinners? Whew. Let me tell you, in high school, that was my jam with those TV dinners. And I think they still make those. I thought that they went by the wayside, but I hear they still make those. So in the TV dinner, you always had the mystery meat at the bottom. My favorite mystery meat was Salisbury steak. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know what it tasted like. It was like hamburger or meatloaf or I don't know what it was, but they covered it with gravy and it made it better. Salisbury steak. So that was like the main course. And then you would have the vegetable with corn and you'd have those peas on the side that everyone threw away. Nobody ate those peas. My mom would look at that and say, what, you need to eat your peas? No, nobody eats these, mom. They're just for looks. They're like Christmassy. And then there was always that brown thing in the middle that at first nobody knew what it was because it looks like somebody threw up the Salisbury steak and made that brown thing. That's not what it was. That is a brownie. I learned that early on and I ate my brownie first. But people like to compartmentalize their lives. And they have the main course, like their work, the things that they love to do, their recreation. That's like the main part of what they do. And then they have their family life in the corner, completely separate from the work and the recreation. And then you have over here on the other side, things that you may want, future desires, your future, your prayers that you just don't feel answered. And then in the center, you have this small section that we designate for God. God, you get one hour 
and 10 minutes on Sunday. And if Pastor Glenn goes over, I may not come next week because he, he ate into the week after. And so, or we give God that little section of five minutes a day. But we're not going to overlap our family. We're not going to overlap our work, our friends. All of that's separate. God, all that's me. That's my time. I want you to know that's not how God works. God is not looking for five minutes of prayer every single day in your life. God doesn't want to be part of five minutes of your day. God is our life. And he wants to be part of everything that you are carrying, everything that you're going through. He wants to be part of every area of your life. That's the God that we serve. He's not a compartmentalized God. He is part of the entire mystery meat TV dinner. God wants to be part of it all. It's not just an action that you do. It's a way that you live. There's a verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. For a lot of people that are like, I don't understand this verse. This verse is impossible. There's no way we can do that. But I want to give you three translations of this verse in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17. And it says, in the NLT, never stop praying. How are we going to never stop praying? In the NIV, it says, pray continually. In the King James, it says, pray without ceasing. But I want you to know what this verse is saying is prayer is a way of living your life. God's with you. And we could talk to him wherever we are at any time. You don't have to break away from things to get quiet, to fold your hands and kneel down and posture. That's the only way you're going to find God in prayer. That's great if you do that. But you don't have to do that. You could talk to him when you drive your truck or your car on your way to work. You could talk to him when you're at work. When you have someone getting up in your grill, your next door neighbor, because you blew the leaves on there, you could pray as that conversation is happening. And when you do, you'll have a much better response than you would if you didn't pray. You can pray when you're about to lose your temper with your children. You know the buttons that are pushed with your spouse and people around you that you pray while that's happening and it will temper the way that you respond. When you're running late for church and your kids are making noise behind you and you're stressed out, trust me, that happens every Sunday. The enemy doesn't want you to be happy at church. So he just designs these different things to happen. That's why I have a plan. My wife and I have not ridden to church together in 30 years. It worked for us. I have to be here earlier than her. That's the real reason. But you could talk to God when you forgot something. Talk to God when you can't find your keys. Let me tell you, I pray a lot when I can't find my keys. When you're worried about somebody, you can talk to him just like you're talking to your best friends. Prayer is living in the presence of God. Prayer is breathing in God's grace. Oh my goodness. Where would we be without the grace of God in every moment of our day? Prayer is hearing God's whisper. It's enjoying God's power. It's experiencing God's peace. Prayer is all part of all of those things. Prayer is getting alone with God, talking to God, but it's so much more. Prayer isn't just getting what we want from God. It's aligning our heart and our will with God's heart and God's will for our life. I don't know about you. I don't want to do it my way. I stink at my way. I'm terrible at my way. I want my will to line up with the heart of God. And I want my heart and my future to line up with his heart for my future. When you're walking closely with God in the spirit of prayer, what he'll end up doing is he'll show you things. He'll convict you of sins in your life so lovingly and with such care. He'll lead you in the direction he wants you to go. Hearing his prompting, you'll hear what hurts his heart that we may be doing. He'll rejoice with the things that are going on that you're rejoicing. He'll celebrate with you. I mean, I'm a big high-fiver with God. I love it when God does those little things that you know it's God. And I just look at him and I'm like, 
I do do that. Because God cares about the details. He cares about the small things in your life. But oftentimes we just try to do it all on our own and just give God that little piece. God doesn't want that little piece. God wants to be in every area of your thoughts in your life. Max Lucado, wonderful writer. He talked about giving God your thoughts. And he uses four different types of thoughts that he encourages people to give to God. The first is you should give God your waking thoughts. When you wake up in the morning, you say, good morning, God. This is the day that you've made. I'm gonna rejoice and be glad in it. Wake up and say, all right, God, let's go. Let's go. That's not just Tom Brady before the Super Bowl saying, let's go. That's us as believers knowing that God is with us. If God's for us, who can be against us? Let's start our day rejoicing in the presence of God. God, I'd love for you to direct my steps today. God, help me to see the needs of those that are around me. Help me to speak words of life to the people that you put before me. God, convict me of anything that may be out of line with your will. God, I'm devoting my day to you. Give God your waking thoughts. And then Max Locato goes on to say, the next thing you should give God is your waiting thoughts. Whatever you're waiting on, you're praying for the salvation of a loved one. You're praying for a miracle. You're praying for provision. You're praying for a breakthrough. Whatever it is that you're waiting on, give it to God. Spend time in prayer with God and say, God, I'm trusting you. That's the hardest things Christians have to do. The waiting is the hardest part. Tom Petty wrote a great song about that. It's a hard thing to do, but that's exactly when God teaches us patience, teaches us how to trust him, teaches us how to have faith in the midst of the waiting. But let me tell you, there's great power in our waiting thoughts. So give him your waking thoughts, your waiting thoughts. The next thing Max Locato talked about was giving God your whispering thoughts. Because you may not want to shout your prayers in the middle of the office. You don't want to be in your office and you feel a demonic oppression and say, in Jesus' name, I bind you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. You might lose your job in that moment. But let me tell you, there are whispering thoughts that we are thinking throughout the day. There are times where it's difficult. There's times that we need God to help us deal with a difficult situation, a difficult conversation, and it's your whispering thoughts, God, give me peace right now. God, help me to do a good job with this presentation. God, give me the words to say as I meet and I share your love with this person that needs you desperately. God, help me to have peace and bridge the gap between me and my 13-year-old son that is going crazy. God, help me to welcome and love my husband or my wife when they come home from a difficult day. God, help me to be a voice of encouragement to the ones that I love the most. It's your whispering thoughts that you're giving to God throughout the day. So we give him our waking thoughts. We give him our waiting thoughts. We give him our whispering thoughts. And then at the end of the day, at the end of communion with God throughout the day, we give him our waning thoughts. You look back at your day and you see that God was here with you during this moment, during their day. Here's what I experienced with you today, God. Here's what I'm thankful that you did for me today, God. And here's what I'm incredibly thankful for that you provided in my life. And whatever the burden is, you go to bed and you say, God, I'm giving you my burdens. I'm giving you my cares. I'm casting it on you because you love and you care for me. God, I'm going to sleep now. I'm not going to think about it anymore because it's all yours. No matter what the answer is, God, I trust you. God, I'm, I'm giving it to you. And I can't wait to see you in the morning with my waking thoughts. And we start a day again in the presence of our Savior.
God is always just one prayer away. First John chapter five, starting in verse 14, it says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears whatever we ask, we know that we have what is asked of him. Philippians chapter four, verse six and seven, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You see, you don't start you don't stop praying. You don't stop believing. You're walking in the spirit. You're living in his love. You're aware of his goodness. Throughout the day, you're experiencing his grace. When you're weak, his strength is made perfect. When you're tempted, the power of God will overcome you to allow you to overcome a way out for every temptation that comes your way. When you're discouraged, he's the glory and the lifter of your heads. Joy always comes in the morning. So bring him your waking thoughts. Bring him your waiting thoughts, your waiting thoughts. When you're weary, trust God because in your weariness, you'll be faithful and you'll reap a harvest in the proper time if you don't give up. Give him your whispering thoughts. Let him know, God, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And in the stillness of your prayers, so many, so many people that are waiting for this big moment. It's in the stillness that God will speak the whispers. You see it in Elijah. He said to Elijah, it's not in the earthquake. It's not in the wind. It's not in the fire. That's not where my presence is. My presence is in the whisper. And the only way we're going to hear the whispers of the Holy Spirit in our heart is to be still and know that he's God. And at the end of the day, you cast your cares upon the Lord and you trust him because he loves and cares for you. Praying, it's not a complicated event. It's a way of living your life constantly in the presence of your Lord and your savior. I'm not talking about you walking around talking to your imaginary friend. I'm not sending you to some psychiatrist, some psychiatrist or whatever, some therapy. No, it's living the Christian life. It's living the way that Jesus lived, hand in hand with a Lord and Savior that loves you and cares for you and wants to see you through to live a life that's abundant, a life that is full, to live life that is full. That's the life that Jesus offers to you and to me. He gives you life to the full. That's the life I want to live, church. But it's not going to happen by living that way in January and then going back to the way we lived in February. You want a difference in your life? Let this be the way you live your life from this point on. God, my life and my prayer life is going to be completely different because you're part of everything. And if God's for you, who can be against you in Jesus' name? Can you say amen? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, we thank you for your presence today. Father, we thank, th thank you that we can get alone with you and hear your whispers and your care and your love. We can experience your peace, your joy. We can experience all these things as we walk in your presence throughout our days. Lord, Teach us to pray. Teach us to trust. Build our faith. Take away the unbelief, Lord. Help us with our unbelief and help us to trust you because you are so trustworthy. In Jesus' name, every head bowed and every eye closed for just a moment. Maybe you're here today. Maybe you've been far away from God and you're hearing about this intimate relationship that he wants to have with you. It can all change in a moment of recognizing where you are and allowing God in that rightful place on the throne of your heart. Maybe you, you've never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. 
You can know him. It's not about religion. It's not about church attendance. It's not about being good enough. Salvation is the free gift that God gave to each one of us through belief in him and faith in what he did for us when he went to the cross, sacrificed his life, the perfect lamb of God that was sacrificed for your sin and my sin and was raised on the third day and is sitting at the right hand of the Father praying for you and me. You can know that today by simply accepting the free gift of salvation. And if you're here today, I'm not, I'm not gonna call you out, I'm not gonna embarrass you, but if you're here today and you wanna be included in this prayer for salvation or rededication or recommitment, when I count to three, just raise your hand. It's just gonna be between me and you. I'm gonna pray for you and I'm believing that today is a new day for you in Jesus. One, two, three. Raise your hand up high if that's you. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, I see your hands over here and yours and yours. Raise it up high. We're in church. If you can't do it with believers, where are you going to do that? Yes, thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. I see your hand back there. Thank you so much. Can you repeat this prayer after me? This is just a simple prayer of faith that we're praying together. But I'm believing that today is going to be a new day for so many people that responded to that gospel message today. Will you repeat after me? Lord Jesus, Thank you for what you did for me on the cross. You gave your life so that I might know life, abundant life, eternal life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart today. I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, my Savior, my God, and truly my best friend. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, church. Bundle up, get in your pajamas when you get home, take a nap, and don't forget to walk daily hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. I love you, church. Amen. We appreciate you, Pastor Glenn, so much and what God is doing in this place. If you prayed that prayer of salvation for the first time, we have a free gift for you. It is a book that you'll find on either side of the stage here. And we just invite you after service is over, after I say the blessing, to come up and receive that. But to receive your blessing today, would you please stand with me? And you can raise your hands, you can raise your hearts, you can turn your palms upward in an attitude of receiving. May the Lord bless each and every one of you with an awareness of his presence every moment of every day. May you be blessed to breathe his spirit with the knowledge that his ear is always inclined to you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I love you, church, and I'll see you this Worship Wednesday.